He's ready. Even if you're not, please welcome Governor John Kasich. Welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you for doing this with us. Glad to do it. So um, I'm going to ask you to do kind of what everybody has done to start us off, which is to talk a little bit uh, about how you see the problem with K through 12 education in this country. Do you believe that our public schools are in crisis? Well, look, I'm, I'm the governor of Ohio, so I, I actually wrote down a short list of uh, all the things we've been doing in Ohio to try to fix the schools. To, there's a, a variety of things that have to be done. Number one, I think that we have to break the agrarian model, Campbell, which is we stick everybody in a classroom and we try to teach everybody the same way. And as we all know, children learn in different ways. And secondly, when I talk about breaking the agrarian model, I think that we ought to feed young people's passions. So for example, my daughter loves uh, uh, design, okay? Uh, she's been, she's visited uh, Pink. She's visited uh, Victoria's Secret Sport. She's 15 years old. I want her to be able to get credit in high school for spending two or three hours a week there uh, where she can get excited about what she might want to be in her lifetime. If you take somebody who is at risk of dropping out and just say they want to spend their time uh, working when they get home, they want to work on their car. Well, why don't we let them go and work on their car a little bit during the day, and then the person that owns the shop can explain to them why they need to know math so they can charge, and why they need to know English so they can advertise. I think we need to bring excitement into K-12 education. But in addition to that, I think it's very important that we have evaluations, both of teachers and of schools, so that the people who are here can know how their school's actually performing vis-a-vis -vis other schools. Uh, and I think teacher evaluation is important. And I also think we need a robust school choice program. We've ex dramatically expanded choice, whether it's charter schools or vouchers. <laughs> it's a whole series of things that need to be done. Here's the problem. In my state, and I don't quite know the numbers in this state, but 40% of our high school graduates who want to go to college are taking remedial education at the, at the community college or university level. Now let me ask you all a question, the people that are here. Why are our kids having to take 10th and 11th grade work when they go to college? Why are we not getting our children educated to the point when they go to college, they're ready to go and ready to fly and ready to learn? And that drives up the cost of higher education. So it's so many different things that we need to do. And finally, I would say this. There is no substitute for local control, but for parents, just don't walk in the school building and, and just listen to what the administrators tell you. Dig in. Know how kids are performing. Know how they're doing. Know what the heck is going on in the classroom. Because many times when parents will go into a schoolhouse, they'll be told, well, everything is great. And then we find out later, it wasn't so great. So local control matters. But if we're going to have local control, which we need to have, then, then people at the local level need to take control of their schools, period. End of, end of that. There's a lot, so much more we could talk about. We are. We've got 45 minutes. Don't worry. But I want to I wanna go deep on what's going on in Ohio, because you have, a, you have an interesting story to tell. And you've embraced um, school choice in a way that many other states yeah, have We have 60,000 vouchers, both for failing schools and for poor kids, and there's one other thing we've done, Campbell, that you may not know about that I, I, I want these folks to know. The Cleveland public schools were failing. Are you aware of this? They were failing. So the Democrat mayor of Cleveland, along with the business leaders, came to me and said, we would like to change the Cleveland schools. We basically want to put a CEO in charge of the schools to drive education change. On a bipartisan basis, the legislature has created the most dramatic reform, I believe, of public education in the North in America. Cleveland's making strides. It's very tough to change a model that had been broken for a long time, but it requires everybody to work together on behalf of those kids, and they're making progress. The Youngstown schools 
have basically been in a failure mode for nine years. And I had been warning people in Youngstown that this is not tolerable. And, um, but it is very hard to get a community together to reform local schools. I'll tell you why. Because a lot of times business leaders don't want to do it because the minute they start questioning local education excellence, they get lambasted in the press or they get criticized in the community. So it takes time to build up a head of steam to take control of these of the schools. So in, over this period of nine years, kids were migrating out of the Youngstown schools to suburban schools, just leaving a smaller and smaller number of students. And I think only 1% of the students in that school district were college ready. So we now have created something that the country should look at. If our schools fail for three straight years, there is a committee that can come together to appoint a CEO in charge of those schools to start to get them improved. And as the schools improve, we will hand it back to the local school board. And at the end of the day, uh, we will set them free once education starts. So we don't tolerate a long period of failure anymore in Ohio. And we all know the challenges of being able to drive education, particularly in our urban school districts. So I actually believe that what's going to happen in Youngstown, which has been a hard bitten town, hard hit town with jobs, where jobs are now coming back, and I believe what we're doing in Youngstown to improve those schools is going to save the city. We had the Catholic bishop involved. We had some of the big business leaders involved. Um, the disappointment was it was a party line vote to get this done, and there's no excuse for it because we got, you know, look, education, K through 12 education is not for adults, it's for children. And we need to make sure that people understand that, okay? It's not to make us happy, it's to make sure kids learn. Um, you've been very focused on giving parents more options, I know. Talk a little bit, uh, we'll talk about charters in a second, but talk a little bit about the voucher program um, in Ohio, you've expanded it. Can you? Well, we have a 60,000 voucher opportunity. We don't have all the parents taking advantage of it, which is unfortunate. And if you're poor, we also have created a special program that we're phasing in over time. And of course, we also have charter schools. But I will tell you, we're not going to tolerate fail, failed charter schools. I don't, I don't care what kind of education environment you have, we're not going to tolerate failure. So, you know, there's been a lot of criticism, and some of it very legitimate, about charter schools. So, let me, let me just interrupt there. Yeah. Not everybody may know. So, your charter schools in Ohio have not performed maybe as well as the... Oh, well, yeah, some their, have and some haven't. But, but you know, the charter... The reform of charters and, and how important. you hold them accountability is something you're really focused on. It's been a story in Ohio. How do you do it? Well, we have standards where we look at how they're performing, and if they're not performing, we don't permit the sponsors to... Uh, to open up anything else and we'll shut down the failing charter schools. And look, the legislature's still working with it. Here's the problem. When charter schools were first an idea in Ohio, it was, we, it, the, the legislature wanted it to be unfettered so that people could move from the traditional school to the charter school. <clears throat> but what's happened over time is it's, been, it's time now to clean up a failed charter school. Uh, but it's hard for for legislators, Republicans, to, to do that. So we're working our way through the legislature to make sure that any school that a, that a child, a student enters is gonna be one of quality. So we look at what the, you know, how they're performing, and if they're performing well, we love them. I mean, many of them perform very well. Here's the problem. It is easy for people in the education profession to criticize charter schools while at the same time they cast a blind eye to failed uh, public schools in the traditional sense. So, we want both. We want successful public schools. We want successful charter schools. We want high standards in, in virtually um, every school. So, and, and the other thing that we've done is we've given parents the opportunity to actually take over their local schools. If these schools are failing, parents can reconstruct the schools. I mean, it's just um, unbelievable all the things that we have been able to do, plus robust funding for the schools and including a special ed. I mean, it's Look, we're, we're gaining, but we don't have a lot of fear when it comes to making these changes. It's just sometimes it's hard to work against a, a status quo in K through 12 education. And, and folks, we cannot 
we cannot worship at the altar of status quo when it comes to public education. We're in the 21st century. We need to keep changing and making education more and more exciting. We lose too many children because we don't touch their passions. To your credit, you've tried a lot of things. Yeah. And you have taken on this fight because I think education, to a lot of people, it's a fight. You We're know winning. That. We're winning the fight. You no, want no some question. Or have you lost? Well, you have lost some. What, what, what is a policy you didn't get that you wish you had been able to implement or you'd like to still try? You know, I can't, uh, Campbell, honestly, I'd, I'd have to you know, sit down and ask my staff where we're frustrated, but we've gotten 85, 90% of everything we wanted, whether it's education or anything else, uh, because we, in the first four years I was there, Ohio was a basket case. So when you have a crisis, you ever heard the term, you know, never waste a good crisis? We did not, and, but we keep pushing, we keep pushing and pushing. You know, we've now brought in I'll tell you something we did. We created an innovation fund. You want to know my, my greatest frustration? What I need to have more superintendents in my state willing to take risks and chances for the betterment of education of children, OK? Because what I have found is that there are a lot of the administrators in our schools who are you know, they, 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 the status quo is easy for them. And it's frustrating to me. But we're getting most of what we want. But we created an innovation fund. So if you want to do something particularly innovative that may cost money, we've got money available for you to do it. So we have school districts that have come together, <clears throat> particularly in some of our poor or uh, rural areas, that are going together in terms of, uh, of uh, information technology, the kind of things that you'll hear Joel Klein talk about. But here's the question. <clears throat> Why do I have to create an innovation fund when I don't think we should have to give anybody an incentive to do and change and do what's right versus the kids? So that's a frustration for me. I just think, and there are many, many great superintendents and school teachers in particular, and I think teachers feel pounded upon, and I respect that. They feel like the community doesn't appreciate and doesn't understand the problem of the students in the classroom. We somehow, Republicans, Democrats, liberal conservatives, we gotta thank our teachers and we've gotta, we've gotta be supportive when the time comes to drive innovative change in our schools. Um, you typically think of Republicans at war with the teachers union, but I was reading, and, and you were at war with the teachers union initially in Ohio, tell me if this is a fair characterization, but then the head of the Teachers Union in Ohio had very nice things to say about you that I read recently. Well, look, that she uh, thought you'd make a great president. Well, here's a couple things. First of all, uh, the American Federation of Teachers have worked co co uh, collaboratively with us on the Cleveland School Plan. They said they understand the community wants it. Uh, there is the head of the union there has been almost lost re-election because of the Cleveland School Plan. Um, and we have to make sure that we, we have a good, open relationship. But that's not up to me, really. It's up to the superintendent of the Cleveland schools. But when the time came to fix the Youngstown schools, the Ohio Education Association and the union fought us every step of the way. I, I, I can't, I, I, this just is so difficult for me. We got nine years of failure and the message is, well, just give us a little bit more time. Now, we may have lost almost a generation of, of students, and I'm really upset about it. I'm not going to yell at anybody, but I'm very, very upset. We, everybody should have been involved in, in fixing these Youngstown schools. Nine years, C Campbell, of failure. And yet they say when we have legislation to change it, they said no. So, <clears throat> Basically, what I've told the union in the schools is this. If we work together, fine. If we don't work together, that's not fine. And we're going to have to deal with it. So, you know, as a leader, I, I want to always maintain uh, patience, but I don't want patience to drag out where it costs a, a child a chance to become something special and live their God-given purpose. So it's, it's a mixture. And... Um, some places we've had success, other places we have not. But I'm glad that, to hear that uh, I think it was probably the American Federation of Teachers, the head of it said, you know, John Kasich's a good guy. 
um, we're all in this together. I mean, I think that's good. But, but don't block reforms that are designed to give children a chance. Well, what she said was she believes that poverty and helping low-income kids is something that you genuinely care deeply about. And let me on that point ask you... Early childhood education yeah. is a critical part of what we're trying to do. Um, you, as, as a governor who's really embraced school choice, um, talk about what... De define it a little more for us. Um, do you support a universal um, school choice vouchers for everyone, or is it more of a social justice model where you think it's... No, should look, we're up to 60,000 vouchers and only using 20,000 of them. So uh, let's try to push that and push those numbers up, and then we'll... So we've done it two ways. One is to give you a voucher if you're in a failing school. There's also vouchers, of course, for the Cleveland School Plan, which allows uh, people to have vouchers there, and, and now also for poor. So it's, it's two... It's two um, two directions, but I'm always mystified that more people aren't taking advantage of it and taking advantage of something else that's interesting, and that is this individual education plan. You can get your, you, if you're a parent in our schools now, you can approach uh, the principal and you can say, I want my, my son or daughter to be an individual education program, which means they can have the flexibility to do many, many different things, be able to get credit, be able to graduate, and be able to get ahead. The other thing that we've put in, Campbell, that people here ought to think about, we put in a third grade reading guarantee. Now this was, a, this was one that, you know, met some controversy. The schools were saying, well, if you're going to force us to be able to make sure our kids can read at the third grade level before they go to the fourth grade, you need to give us more money. So we gave them a little bit of money, but my question to them is, if we're not teaching kids to read in the kindergarten, the first grade, the second grade, and the third grade, what are we teaching them? Because you, you read to learn, and you learn, or you learn to read so you can read to learn. So we put this third grade reading guarantee in. So you can't get to the fourth grade in reading, uh, and you're still held as a third grade student until you can up your performance. Now, we will give you all kinds of work and help, and we start this in pre-K and then get into kindergarten. You know what's great? Initially, this was um, resisted. But it became clear we're not repealing it. You try to repeal it, I'll veto it. I mean, we're not changing this. And guess what's happened? Libraries, teachers, local community, senior citizens have all come together to help kids learn how to read at the third grade level. level. And, the, and the performance has gone sky high. And here's another thing to know. If kids can't read, it's the biggest single reason why they drop out. So we can get kids to read, we can prevent dropouts because then we have a program for dropout recovery because we want people who have not been able to be successful not wander the streets and be able to get a job. And, and you bring up a, the poor. Um, we have early childhood education. I mean, it's very expensive. I think you probably all know that in New Hampshire. It's expensive, but it's vital because those brains, they're fertile and we can't sh let them shut down so we are expanding early childhood education, and we're bringing the standards up in Ohio so that the early childhood education, Campbell, more or less, is, uh, is going to be, be equal and, and a higher and higher standard. Uh, let me shift gears to Common Core. Sure. Do you still support it? Look, let me tell you the way I see <clears throat> what that label is. The governor of Georgia, Sonny Perdue, and by the way, you don't get elected governor of Georgia if you're a liberal, got together with another governor before I became governor, and they said that students across the country, <coughs> excuse me, ought to have the same opportunities at a high education with high standards. They brought in school officials, state of school education officials and education experts, and, and they created a set of standards. In my state, we had had lower standards. Massachusetts, our neighbor here, you know, they push very high standards. Their students are doing very well in Massachusetts. So I look at this, and if you have a low bar, everybody gets to jump over. You remember Lake Wobie gone? Everybody's getting an A. Um, and then we get to graduation, and 40% aren't ready for college. So what I believe in Ohio is we should have high standards. And the curriculum to meet high standards needs to be developed by local school boards with parental advisors. I don't write the standards. 
President Obama doesn't write the standards or the curriculum. We have the high standards as established as is where we should go, and we do it only in math and in English. And the bottom line is we have higher standards with school boards writing the curriculum to meet the higher standards with parental advisory. I think that's pretty good because I don't, I don't support Washington doing, I mean, I have a whole lot of thoughts about Washington. I was there in the 90s when we tried to eliminate the Department of Education, okay? I was the chairman of the budget committee. But I, there is no substitute for higher standards and a way to make sure local school boards are involved, that parents are involved, and at the end of the day, we have some testing to figure out how kids are doing. I, so if other states don't want to do that, that's fine. But if I were president, <clears throat> I would want to travel across the country to state legislatures, telling them about the laboratories of the laboratories of change in each of the states. So we practice best practices. I mean, if you've got a way to do it here in New Hampshire, then I should go back to Ohio and try to implement it there. But I think presidents should not reign from on high. They ought to be out here giving the control back to states and local communities and being part of the process to develop and share great ideas across the country. So, you know, I don't, I don't know about that term and all that stuff. I'm just telling you what we're doing in Ohio. Why have um, so many of your competitors uh, flip-flopped on Colleagues. That? Colleagues. <laughs> they are my colleagues. colleagues. Why have why, they rejected why have they, it? Why have they changed? Know, They've you, changed their positions um, a lot. I don't change my positions on much unless uh, this fine gentleman here in a nice relaxed shirt and beard can, uh, you got a better idea for me. I'm always willing to, to change my mind if somebody can present a case to me as to why my position is wrong um, on anything. I mean, that's called open-mindedness. Uh, but you're going to have to make a good case. Uh, but, but look, for me, I'm not going to change my position because there's four people in the front row yelling at me. I just don't operate that way. You know. When I get hired as governor, I'm a CEO. You hire me, I do my job. I'm not going to, you know, there, okay, what, what's there now? On the other hand, I know that the public has been very concerned about this. And that's why in our legislature, we wrote into the law local control with local school boards, writing the curriculum with parental advisors. Why'd we do it? because I hear the public yelling about this and they're concerned about it because they love their kids and they're worried their kids are at risk. But I have to tell you, in looking through all the facts and not getting all my information from the internet and looking at this over and over and over again, I concluded in my state, we need to raise our standards. I want my, I have two 15 year old daughters, I want my daughters to come out with the best education. And do I like when they get A's? Love it. But you know what? I'd rather know that they're getting a B or worse than that so we can work on fixing it so that they can, they can be better. I mean, that's what education is about. It's about unlocking your future. And that's what I'm most concerned about, Campbell. So on any of these issues, everybody here needs to understand. I look at stuff. I study. I can't tell you how many times I've called our state superintendent of schools with at least 10 questions. I, I mean, over and over, tell me this, tell me that, tell me this, because I want to know the facts. And once I know the facts, then I'm going to make up my mind and I'm going to be the best leader I can be. But none of this finger in the air stuff for me. And I'm not putting anybody else down. Everybody has to lead the way they want to lead or do it the way they want to do it. I'm just telling you how I do it. Um, let's talk about the federal government's role in education, what, how, what you might do as president, but start with um, what's going on the debate around federal education policy in Washington today, which is the reauthorization of the ESEA or updating No Child Left Behind. Well, look, I How mean, we should think about it. I, how do I, you think about it? Yeah, I, I believe that not only in the Department of Education, but in welfare, in job training, in, I mean, so many areas I can give you. And remember, I was chairman of the committee and the chief architect of when we balanced the budget. And so we had a lot of reform in, in those programs. We didn't get everything we wanted because we were Republicans and Bill Clinton was the president. And he's a very clever man because if there's a mob f forming, he'll jump in front of it and claim it's a parade, okay? So we as Republicans, we as Republicans decided we wanted to balance the budget, which was so exciting because we were able to develop a lot of reform. I'm going to tell you something that was a mistake. 
when we use the rhetoric that we're going to kill the Department of Education. Do you know what independent voters heard? Oh, so the Republicans want to kill education. So we've got to be careful with the way in which we use our rhetoric. What would I do? There are about 100 plus, maybe 110 federal programs. I think we need to bundle them up and we need to send them back to the states so that the states can develop their own uh, ideas about how best to educate their kids. That's back to we see what you do, we look in Ohio, we look in Illinois, we look in Texas, and I want to move those programs. I want to empower people in the states. I do not want the states taking education money and using it to pave roads. You hear what I'm saying? We don't take education money and fix our highways because we can't figure out how to deal with that. I think we have to make sure that education money goes to educate. And I think on special education, that's a separate block grant that should come back, and special education is very expensive, and, um, and so we've got to make sure we maintain that. But fundamentally, we need to begin to transfer uh, money and influence and power out of that town in many areas where it would be more effective where we live. See, Washington operates under a one-size-fits-all mentality. So my, I have a size 10 foot, and you have a size 6 foot, but we all have to put our feet in the same size shoes. That, that doesn't work. <clears throat> is, local, is local control perfect when schools are failing like they were in Youngstown? No, but here's what I do know. As a citizen, it's a lot easier for me to get my meeting with the local school board and local education officials than it is to try to talk to somebody in Washington. Now, you know, I'm from Ohio, and when I used to call Washington on various things, they would say to me, what's the time zone in Ohio? Now, if they don't know what time zone it is, how are they supposed to fix my problems? And so I believe we need to shift that, and we need to be as, we need to be as reformers pro-education. The child is first. Education's for kids and not for adults. And we need to fashion our creative solutions at the local level, and we have to have the courage of human beings to get out of our comfort zone, ladies, to make sure our kids are learning. And sometimes that means shaking it up a little bit. See that cross you're wearing around your neck? The Lord expects that. He expects us to get out of our comfort zone on the behalf of children. Because, you see, education is about unlocking this brain to discover and improve the world. I'm, Campbell, I'm reading an incredible book on the Wright brothers. And, and what it meant for them to be able to use their brains to see the future. I mean, incredible. That's what education has to be, stimulating us to think and do better. Let me just push you a little bit on this, because in yeah. many states, local control means union control. And if you advocate for school choice, if you care about that, that would be losing a lot of progress that's been made in places like New York. How do, you, how do you do both? How do you encourage states to offer parents more choices at the same time? Um, Strengthening the public school. Well, you do it in two ways. One is, um, first of all, your vouchers and your, your charters need to be, your, your charters need to be high quality. Your vouchers are giving parents an opportunity not to destroy public education, but to offer competition so public education gets better. The purpose of vouchers is to provide competition. You know, if I like to say if you're the only pizza parlor in town, uh, the only way when you order pizza you're going to get more pepperoni is if we get a second pizza parlor in town, okay? So we need to have that competition, not to destroy, but to build. And then I would say, secondly, teacher evaluation, parents knowing how their school is performing, um, giving, giving you know, this commission we have in Ohio now that can take over failing schools. These are the kinds of things that will improve quality, but I don't see those things as, look, I mean, if the union was to vote on charters or vouchers, they would vote no. Okay, thank you, I appreciate your position. We're going to have vouchers and charters, okay? So that happens to be, I'm the governor now, I support that. The last governor didn't, but I do. But how do you do that? Elections if matter, don't how, they? How do you do that if you're president? How can you influence that to, oh, I think you to gotta, push the things you know work? You got, you got to go to the legislatures. 
I mean, could you imagine if we had presidents, a president who would come to New Hampshire and talk about the good things that are happening in four or five states and how kids are doing better? Let me, let me give you a perfect example. I, I, could, I have all this list here, but I haven't been using it. Um, I went, listen to this, Campbell. The Cincinnati public schools have, I believe, a 63% graduation rate. So I went down to this one high school in the Cincinnati school district, and they have a mentoring program. It's all poor minorities in this high school. Two companies, Western and Southern Insurance Company, and I don't remember the other, the other uh, company, allows their employees to go for one hour a week for a year into the school system to mentoring a kid. You know what the graduation rate is in that high school? 97% mentoring works. We now have a big mentoring initiative going on in Ohio, along with one other called Start Talking, which I can't forget. Mentoring kids of all ages, mentoring kids of all incomes, mentoring kids of all cultures to show them the future, what life could be like. So I'm reforming welfare, okay? I'm now in a business of reforming welfare where you got to go and get trained for a job that exists while you get your benefits. And I said to the people who were involved in this, who, some of whose parents were on, on relief, I said, how do we break the pattern of, of, of welfare dependency? And you know what they told me? Mentoring. Mentoring means they can, Campbell, you go into a, a, into a schoolhouse and they, they, they meet you and they see you and they admire you and they see your clothes and they see your car and all of a sudden they begin to see a world that they didn't know existed. Isn't it exciting to think about to me, it's very exciting about change in a life. So I would want to tell the whole country about mentoring. I don't have to dictate it, but I think if I come to New Hampshire as the president and I make a speech on this, you're going to do it, because it works. I'll tell you the other thing we're doing that I'm, I'm begging you to think about here. We have a program in Ohio now called Start Talking. We have asked every teacher virtually every week to have talking points to talk to kids about staying off of drugs. When kids here don't do drugs, there is a 50% less chance they will do them. We don't have a big curriculum. We don't have to pay a lot of money. We just need the teacher to say, stay off drugs. And then we have our highway patrol going and meeting with the sports, the kids in sports, who are the mentors, the boys and the girls who are in sports, and we five minutes for life to talk to them about staying off drugs. I've, I've given you two ideas. You may be doing all of them. But number one, develop a mentoring program in, in, in this state. Number two, create Start Talking. Start telling kids to stay off of drugs. Because as you know, in this state, we've got a heroin crisis. Can we beat it all down? No, but we can, we can begin to win the battle in this war. So that's how I do it, Campbell. Tell uh, them about all this great stuff. Let me, um, let me let you just get a little bit personal <clears throat> for a second. I've asked everybody this question. Tell me a teacher in your life who's been very influential for you that you know, had an impact on you in some way. And then can you know, your, your thoughts more generally on, on how we elevate the profession of yeah. teaching and reward teachers and make them feel valued? Well, I think, I think part of the challenge is, as you know, somebody once told me, uh, a friend of mine, uh, he said, you know, when I was back in Congress, he would give us a lecture, and he would say, when you get home and you see your spouse, and your spouse, you know, who's doing all the hard work, you're in the spotlight, and they're doing all the work. Sit down in the mud puddle with them. You don't have to say anything. Just sit down with them and listen. And I think a lot of our teachers feel that we don't understand the challenges they have in the classroom because they're getting kids who have been basically have not been loved, that when we evaluate them, they think, oh my God, we're out to take their job. No, we're not out to take their job. If, you're, if you need help, we'll help you. If you're a terrible teacher, then you should be doing something else because you're going to find more satisfaction doing something that you're good at. 
So we have to constantly communicate that. But I'll tell you what the unions do, unfortunately, too much of the time. There's a constant negative comment to, they're going to take your benefits, they're going to take your pay, they're going to... And so if I were, not president, but if I were king in America, I would abolish all teachers' lounges where they sit together and <laughs> worry about uh, how woe well is us. But look, teachers are, I mean, you ask me, do I have teachers? Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of mentors in my life. And, uh, and some, some of the teachers were people that, um, that even a couple of my buddies and I still repeat some of the things they'd ask us in the classroom. Like, if you know this and you know this, you don't need me. Uh, so we have to hold up the profession of teaching. You know, here's the other thing. How do we pay a college football coach $4 million a year? We pay our teachers peanuts. But, but that's all entertainment, isn't it? It's all entertainment. But we've got it all upside down. I mean, I, you know, we can't fix all these things, but we can think about them and talk about them. Um, you know, one point I wanted, we had a little bit of left money left over, and I wanted to give a bonus to teachers, but I was afraid the union would say, oh, well, you're now introducing, uh, you know, some sort of merit pay. And I mean, common sense is so important in life, including education. But Campbell, we need to, we need to, to thank a teacher, but we need to make sure they're teaching. You know, if they're not teaching very well, we need to either help them to, to get better, or secondly, they shouldn't be teaching. You know, in Cleveland, our superintendent, when we get this massive school uh, reform program, they actually bought out the most senior teachers who were tired and didn't want to teach anymore. And guess who they brought in? The ones they fired. And the, the, the last in, first out, last one hired, first one out, bad policy needs to be changed. And by the way, I think I see Joel Klein sitting here, and I, I think he's going to talk. And I hope that what he's going to do is he's going to show you in a breathtaking way how technology can get kids so fired up about learning. You know, I don't know if you know this or not, um, but kids really like their devices. Have you ever <laughs> noticed that? So why don't we give them devices to learn on? Why don't, we, why don't we develop teachers who want to be coaches for kids as they develop their individual ways of learning? Isn't this all great? The only thing that stands in the way of these kinds of ideas is the status quo. Oh, no, I don't think we can do that. That's too hard. It's up to us at the local level to make sure that stuff happens. S expand you know, on I'm having a ball here. I hope you're enjoying this. Yeah. I'm having fun. Yeah. Expand on the innovation piece a little bit. I've asked everybody this as well, which is to envision the classroom of the future, what your grandchildren's classroom will look like, given that a century's gone by, and we're still teaching our kids today the, the same way, essentially, our grandparents learned. Well, learned. that's why, in the beginning, when I sat here, I said we need to break the agrarian model. And that's why some of the things that Joel Klein will talk to you about in terms of different ways of teaching and connecting is so very important. And I really do believe, again, let me ex ex say this to you. You all remember? when you were in school and there was the kid sitting in the back with his head down on the desk, remember that? We all had them in our school. It wasn't that that, that boy or that girl was, was not smart. It's so we didn't connect with them. So I was down in, in South Carolina and they, they bring these big ships in and they unload this incredible cargo and they have these giant, giant um, operators who sit in way above and they and they come down and they clutch these, these things and they lift them up and they move them. So I'm watching all this. I said, what do those people get paid? A lot of money, they tell me. You know, maybe, I think as much as 100000 with overtime. Don't hold me to it, but there was a lot of money. And I said, well, tell me about that. Well, that's nothing but a video game. You see, we need to take what people are interested in and feed it to them in education. And Campbell, you know, I would, I would envision a time when kids are learning at their own speed on subjects that are important, that the, that the officials, local officials figure is important, but I would like teachers to be able to walk around the room and be coaches for the individual ways that students are learning and allow them to get... When I was a, a kid, I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, 
you know, at one point I wanted to be a priest, then a lawyer. You tell me what, you know, that's like two sides of diff two different coins. Um, but I would go into the courthouse as a young man, and I would watch them argue up there. I couldn't get enough of it, but I didn't get any credit for it. So had I been able to work in a law office, have a young boy can work, or girl in an auto uh, dealership, if somebody wants to be in music, let them have some time out there and invest the, 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 the sense that somebody running those facilities is going to work to, to teach kids education in a, in a backwards way. And do you understand what I mean by that? So I'm working in an auto body shop or I'm working on an engine and I say to the kid, do you want to charge for that? Yeah. Hey, well, you better know math. If you don't know math, how are you going to get paid? Or, or do you want to advertise that you're the best mechanic in the country? Oh, sure I do. Do you know how to spell? See, it's a backdoor approach to learning where we stimulate and bring reality of what... The, I'm going on and on. I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Kim. No, you've got four more minutes. You can go on. Oh, I didn't even no, know. No. I, I don't even look at these clocks. Let, I see. Let me say... <laughs> Let, um, you, you clearly thought about this a lot. I mean, oh, we pretty, do all the you're, time. You're steeped in it. Yep. Um, who, you, I, to, you know, I don't know whether you would tell us who you would think about for Secretary of Education or... No. Who, no. You, maybe, Campbell. <laughs> who, who influences? Who influences your thinking? I want somebody that? who is very solid but who's reform-oriented. I mean, you, you can't just disrupt this. You don't take a sledgehammer and... You, that's not the way it works. It scares people. And we're dealing with kids. But I think you want to have somebody who, well, has your philosophy. Like, I have a school superintendent now. I love this guy. I mean, he is the best, the greatest guy. And you know what he says? It's all about the boys and girls. And um, so you want somebody who, first of all, knows it's all about the boys and girls, but also understands that the power, money, and influence in this needs to be moved to where people can get their hands on it and shape it the way they want to. So I want to tell you one interesting thing. You've been listening to me talk about all these different things. They all have to be done locally, right? Individual education programs, committees that can take over failing schools, improving charters, teacher evaluation, school evaluation. And then we had this big war here in the country over this thing called Common Core. Did you hear anything out of me that didn't represent local control. So we got to sometimes get beyond the headlines and the politics and look underneath to figure out what the reality is. So anything that would, that would charge the federal government, if you take race to the top or even no child left behind, the problem with those programs, there is so much red tape, so much, uh, so much waste, Red tape, rules, one size fits all, they don't work. They don't work. So let's just get it back to where we live. And then when we get it back to where we live, we have to assume responsibility. This is not a free ride. Like, oh, okay, I'm in charge, but by the way, I, I'm not going to spend my time trying to fix things. So, folks, I would just leave you with one thought. I'm almost out of time here, is this. And you don't have to think the way I do. But I believe the Lord watches what we do with our children. And the more we dedicate ourselves to having those children rise and to use their great brains to help heal this world and bring justice, the happier he is. But it's never been easy sometimes to get out of our comfort zone. I got my, my fire from my mother who never was afraid to express an opinion even when it went against the grain. My mom was special, and uh, her son is governor of Ohio and very likely could become president of the United States. Thanks, Mom, for what you did for me. I'll see you all. Governor John Kasich. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.